Some researchers are now saying that your muscles are another endocrine system. In other words, uh, they produce chemicals that affect the body like hormones. In fact, uh, one of these compounds called uh, myokines are being referred to as hope molecules. Why? Because every time you work a muscle, you contract it, it produces this compound, and this particular compound has antidepressant effects, immunomodulary effects, uh, helps heal the body, essentially makes you healthier, it makes you feel good. So your muscles actually produce compounds when you work them that affect the entire body, that improve the health of the entire body. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah, sir. I think you said that in a really complex way. I think there was like a simpler way to say that, right? Well, I mean, uh, your muscles squirt out something that is good for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> How about that? Yeah. I mean, that's maybe somewhere in between. Maybe, yeah. some, maybe some, somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. Like when uh, you when you work out, the body the body releases feel good hormones. Muscles, okay, muscles in particular. Oh, muscles, muscles in particular yeah. release a feel good hormone hormone that could help fight or potentially prevent depression, right? All of it. Depression, inflammation, cancer. So what's interesting is uh, I think when people think of the health effects of building muscle, they think of the muscle itself. So mm -hmm. just healthier muscle. Um, and then maybe some of the side effects of that. But this is an actual compound that the muscle releases that affects the entire body. So like one workout, you produce this. As muscles become more fit, they produce more of these of this particular compound, and yeah, it's got antidepressant effects. You know, it's funny though that you brought this up the other day of like, you know, did we really need a study for this? I know. I mean, have, has anyone ever yeah. been not in the mood to lift and just feeling lethargic and down, just a, a days like that, and then you force yourself to go train, and what happens a hundred percent of the time? You feel better. You feel yeah. better. Yeah. Even if it's not like amazing, you still better. You f still feel better than what you did going into well, that we've like, been promoting this forever it's just like i think there's just new angles of uh focus where you could like kind of point out that this uh, phenomenon happens and these myokines are you know contribute towards this uh antidepressive kind of quality so it's like I, I just feel like you need more data points to to convince people sometimes now so do it there's the this thing works and we know it works so we know for a fact right that exercise has potent um, short-term and long-term antidepressant effects and pro-health effects and anti-poor health effects. The antidepressant effects, by the way, of exercise are remarkable. I mean, there's no antidepressant that compares to, uh, to exercise in the sense that there's no down-regulation receptors. There's no like, oh, it's not working anymore. It actually gets better um, over time. And then the improved health, you know, mm -hmm. contributes to that. Um, so they know it works. This is just helping them identify what is happening yeah. that's making it work. What's because, the mechanism? There? Yeah, and I'm sure down line, down downstream, they're gonna figure out how to make a synthetic form of this myokine, uh -huh. so you could take a pill and then you know. See, I've heard about these before. I've never heard it presented in this fashion. I know there's like a viral viral video going uh, right now where this lady talks about that being the hope molecule, yeah. and like it's always interesting to see. Uh, how these things get sort of like rebranded and sort of presented in a different way. Yeah. It's you, know, interesting. The, you know, the biggest takeaway that I have um, from this is something that it took me a long time to get to this point in my lifting career, which was being okay with telling myself that even though I'm, I'm not in the mood, I don't want to train. I just, I don't feel like I got it to push myself mm. is convincing myself to get in there and do one exercise yeah. at least. Because just by contracting those muscles and starting that process, you release those those chemicals that start to produce you and make you into make you uh, feel in a better mood, and that many times is enough to get me to finish a really good workout. And I, for the longest time, I always had this all or nothing mentality uh, whenever I approached both diet and exercise. And the idea was, man, if I can't get after the workout, what, what am I going to waste my time going in there and do three sets or something yeah. like that's, that's stupid. That's but a huge myth. The, the myth that a, an easy or short workout uh, has no benefit. That's a waste of time. Huge myth. It has benefit. Uh, easy workout has a lot of benefit. In, in fact, sometimes an easy workout has more benefit for you than a hard workout, depending on the context of kind of what's going on. Like an easy workout could be pro recovery, right? Could help facilitate recovery. 
it could boost your mood, whereas a hard workout might not do that. It might make you feel worse, depending on the stress that you have and raise your, health. your energy levels. Yeah. Raise your energy levels, improves creativity. Here's a big one. Like, you know, for a long time, uh in being intellectual or intellectual prowess was separated from physical prowess, right? It's like you were either at, you were athletic or you were smart and there was no crossover. That's such a massive, terrible myth. Let's say you're a writer or an engineer and you need to do something creative or think outside of the box. Uh, movement oh, yeah. oftentimes stimulates that creative process, that thought process. By the way, writers have known this for a long time. Yeah. One of the number one, like, I guess cures or, or remedies Strategies for writer's block for writer's yeah. block. Go for a yeah, walk, go for a walk, go for a walk We've or talked whatever about that forever. I mean, and then they'll get into like mind altering substances and things just to kind of get them to think differently. But mm -hmm. it was always like, get outside, you know, be in nature, go for walks. And that would stimulate new thought process completely. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny too. Cause it's like, if I'm in a like bad space or a bad mood, or I'm feeling really negative about something, I always tell myself, Let's see how I feel after I do some exercise, if I feel the same way. And I almost always feel different. Now, I, I, I wouldn't say I feel radically different. It's not like something bad happens and after my workout, I'm like, that's actually a great thing. But the way I view it or how I feel about it is, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, more positive. Either I feel more empowered or I feel like there's more options or I feel like there's more meaning. And it's always after a workout. Um, and then for creativity and inspiration, I mean, some of the best ideas I've ever had have come in the middle of a workout or right afterwards. Always. It's almost always. I don't know about you guys. You guys ever notice that? Yeah. 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 I mean, it definitely stimulates a lot of creative ideas. And um, it's usually when I'm either I'm doing a light workout or I'm doing something out of the ordinary. So I'm like rotating, I'm doing some kind of functional movement or I'm outside mm -hmm. and kind of in nature in a combo of the both. Very stimulating for creativity. Yeah. 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 It's one of those things for me. It's, uh, for me, it's definitely, and you know, it's, I think you notice this the longer you work out. Cause when you look at like polls of people who exercise consistently, um, and who've been doing so for, let's say like a decade, for example, people have been doing it for a long, long time. Whenever they do polls and they ask them, what are the, the top five reasons why you do this? A appearance is not the top. It's not one or two. Sometimes it's three, but it's usually not one or two. It's always mental health and well-being and like health. Mm -hmm. So like the, the, the way it makes you feel as you do this for a long period of time, you start to realize so much more value in that than the like looking a particular way because that's where the value is. Yeah. Well, that's usually what gets everybody in, mm. you know, and like then the, and the beginners sort of keep that mindset until they realize that this is, this is, you're embarking on a whole lifestyle change. So yeah. it's like, you got to kind of enjoy other elements of it and get motivated in a different way. All right. Today's giveaway is maps split. This is a bodybuilding style maps program. Here's how you can potentially win free access. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this video. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we pick you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. We also have a sale going on right now. Three MAPS programs, 50% off. MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, and MAPS Hit. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. So I have something that I want to talk about that's a little off uh, our our typical subject, so um, bear with me, Sal. Okay. Um, this last weekend, you guys all came over for the Super Bowl. Yeah. And there has been, and this has been kind of like circulating a lot in the, this this past season, more than I'd ever seen in the past. And I and maybe Doug can fact check because I'm not sure how 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 true this is or not. But supposedly, the NFL is uh, classified as an entertainment business. Therefore, they can script how things are going to play out and not be held accountable to some of the betting and stuff like that that what? happens on it. So, yeah. So, my understanding, and again, we got to get fact, fact checked, but uh, in a, a court ruling, they're classified as a as a entertainment business now. And so, yeah. So, all of my friends that had those conspiracies on some of the games that felt like the refs were way too involved and certain teams were kind of pushed through and it um and certain plays were a little suspect like 
uh, I've had friends that have been kind of pointing things out like that along the way. And I'm like, I don't know, man, it's, you know, yes, the ref will, will be a factor like that, but that's kind of considered like the field, right? Like you can't really control a lot of that, but at the same time you do see in the critical moments of the game, how, you know, drastically that changes. Well, there's, there's a lot of odd things that, so if you, and definitely if you listen to this and you and you gamble you you're gonna you're like gonna be like yeah uh-huh yeah like when you bet on the games uh vegas has a line already right that they have mm -hmm. determined before the game starts so just like last night's game okay ironically it was you know, one and a half points you know and it came down to the very last second and you know mm -hmm. they ended up winning by what three right is what the, the final score yep. was so they they tend to be really close and there's moments that happen all the time throughout the season when and if you understand the game, uh, whether that's football, basketball, this, this goes across all sports, there's like certain behaviors that you just know are supposed to happen. And like, okay, they have, uh, the game is already um, won. They're they're well ahead. They're, they're probably going to kneel it out and run the clock out. And then all of a sudden they choose to kick the field goal. But then when you find out, if you were following the, oh, the, line, the spread, this, was, it changed the spread, oh, and it was wow. it was that those three points was enough to cover the Kick spread, over, yeah. right? And it's like whoa, nine times out of ten, that team would just kneel out, but then they wouldn't take the risk. They yeah. would, yeah. Why would they even do that? It makes no sense. And so you see, and so if you're a big sports fan and you watch and you also gamble, you see a lot of this because you're always paying attention to the line because they and know what the line is. Right? Yeah. it's all public. And yes. now you see how like online uh, betting and all that like has really taken over and, and is acceptable now. Uh, with sports gambling and, and, you know, there's the Raiders in Vegas and like, there's, there's a lot more kind of mingling, intermingling of, of sports betting. It looks like. What does it oh. say, Doug? Well, I mean, there's a lot of uh, debate here about this. Yeah. Now this one person says this is not WWE in order for the outcome to be fixed. They'd have to rehearse too many variables for it to be fixed. Referees can influence the outcome of the game, but there's no way the game could be scripted or fixed. Uh, it is classified as sports entertainment, and they can leak, but legally they can't fix games due to many reasons, mainly the gambling associations tied to the game. So, mm. I mean, well, look, here's a, here's how I so they, okay, so you they, don't need to fix the game. That's right. All you need to do yeah, is influence, influence the referees influence a little it, bit. Yeah, yeah. Like we, they proved this with uh, with soccer. Right. Remember that whole deal with the yeah. yeah. So this is somewhat of a protective measure. It, feels like for yeah. them in, in case they get sued because the uh the referee or whatever yeah, the that's enough was. for them to go like yeah. this like, I, oh, well you know we, we say you're not supposed to and we have all, rules and all effect you have, to all you have to have is like probable deniability so yeah. oh, that call could have gone anywhere oh yeah that was one bad call yeah but how many times is a bad call yeah. totally change the direction so now what i think is an even more fun discussion <laughs> okay is uh if it was and there was some of this like scripting going on, or there was definitely refs that were mingling in this and influencing games, and that was happening, and that came public. Would you see a a decline in uh, you know football attendance and uh, no. viewership? No. Nope. Would it go down? No. Nope. You say no at all. No. Remember what they had? In, remember in 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 soccer, there was a huge scandal when they actually came out. Yeah. That the referees were being uh, heavily influenced. Yeah, but that was a little bit different because that was like uh, mafia was influencing, you know, and getting involved. That isn't like the refs and the NFL are, are you know, all they would have to do is conspiring say, together. All they would have to do is like, uh, you know, yeah. fire some people. It's not going to happen again. And then I, I mean, the only way would be if there was another league that was just as popular, which is like good luck. You know, yeah. like the NFL is pretty much well, yeah, that the standard, exist. so that you can't even. And there's such a, a, like a generational legacy with the NFL. Yeah, that do you know how many? You know how hard it would be for people to give that up. Do you Dude. agree, Doug? What do you think? You think it would turn you off? Like, oh, well, I think if they didn't correct it, it would turn me off for sure. So if you're so vested as a fan in the mm -hmm. sport in your team, yeah. and then you find out later that it was all a big fraud. I'd be really pissed off as a fan. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I believed that they were going to fix it, there, there was a problem. They didn't know about it. They went and fixed it. That's then all they I would, would have to do. I'd have to go back. I would go back probably. Okay, so let's pretend they didn't fix it because uh, I think that's a fun. Then that's I, a, I would. You'd lose me as a fan. So I and I would. Still, so if they said, "Yeah, it's happening," but we're not going to do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, that would be <laughs> that would be suicide. I think. Okay, so this this is okay. This is because I that's what Doug I think was implying originally was that 
you know, if it was if it was openly known, like the WWE is the example, right? Yeah. WWF or what it used to be, WWF, um, you know, came out in the in the late eighties, early nineties. Uh, it, it got a lot of you know heat for being fake when there was a huge population that knew it was already. But then there's a lot of people that believed it to be true <laughs> when we were then, kids. There was then a it all came day. out. <laughs> yeah. Now, now here's my argument. I think that even if you knew that it was being influenced and somewhat fixed, you still watch it. You and, and it doesn't lose a fan base. One, the negative news grabs so much attention that you obtain new fans, just like I'm sure WWE did. And the, and the reason why people still pay attention is because even though it's fixed, just like WWE is, okay, that you know there's a script, you don't know what the script is, so you still well, watch. And here's the thing. So maybe you don't bet on it anymore because you don't want to get screwed. If if they are fixing it in like scripting, they imagine how much more ridiculous they would make it. Thank right? you, because then because they the entertainment in. value they're they're gonna really lean into that. Yeah, and so now you're gonna get all these characters like, rah, like so so running down running from, the from the stands yeah. and like, yeah. oh no, look who it is, Joe Montana's yeah. back. Rah! He's gonna play it. Up. I mean, it doesn't have to get <laughs> like, that crazy, right? So I, I do. look up. I uh, so uh, look look up Kanye West uh, says NFL is scripted. So this was just on a recent podcast. This went viral too. This is actually what I thought. Justin, he says a lot of well, stuff. Well, he's though. he's pretty know. balanced though. So. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no <laughs> first of all, Kanye I'm not using him as a who's reference. That, who's next, Adam? I'm not using him as a reference Listen, to guys, prove my point. I just too. wanted to to highlight evidence, this conversation evidence. is happening all he's over the eight. place, <laughs> and and there's a lot of speculation around whether this is something that's happening or or not I happening. I don't think it's. I don't. Yeah. So I would speculate that. Because there's so many players, so much stuff that's going. I don't think it's scripted, but I think it's an. I would. I would imagine all you have to do is in key games, maybe not all of them, in key games, influence the refs enough to where if it's close, they can make a difference. Listen, I know that's it, what I would. The think. reason why you know it's not scripted, okay, is because yes, by yes. now there's there's already been hundreds of NFL players that have played. You, there's been plenty of NFL players that are sour. They didn't get to play that that would come forward yeah, and yeah, rat yeah. out the NFL. So you know it's not fixed like a WWE is fixed. But the the well, the thought that maybe there is a you know whether it be ownership or you know people of power and influence influencing refs yeah. that hey here's the deal tonight's game the line is one and a half points. If there's an opportunity okay. when the Eagles are coming down to tie the game or come over, if there is an opportunity like that, here's here's fifty thousand dollars to make sure that that's a very difficult drive for them. Let me ask you this, dude: Have you ever played in a game where a hundred percent the refs completely took over the game? And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like I've I've played in a few of those. Yeah, and it's really frustrating, but. That's the thing. It's like influence is one way to say it, but really, there are so many variables and options yeah. that they could call at yeah. any moment. Yeah. And like you could just march a team completely back all the way to like the one yard line on the other side just by, you know, being real ticky tack about like the way that yeah. somebody well, had, you know, held somebody for just like a second or, yeah. you know, somebody had, had, whatever, like stepped offside just a little bit. So that's the debate around this, right? Is that, or the, the house people, or no calls. There, yeah. And you know, and, and, and you know this in football. Okay. In football, there is, don't they have instant replay? They have that anymore. Yeah, they do. Yeah. But, but they're okay. So in, in football, there are so many players interacting on the field at once that there is always a penalty that could be called. Right. You can make the case. Point. Yeah. There is always. That's a really good point. There is always a guy who's holding for a few seconds longer yeah. or, you know, tr sticks his leg out and kind of trips a guy or bumps a dude a little more than five. I mean, that there is, there's so much Anything going on call. that yeah. there, there is an opportunity and that's why I think it can be influenced. And in basketball, I think it's just as easy too because uh, basketball is such a momentum sport of back and forth, mm -hmm. and you just interrupt the momentum. Yeah, you interrupt the momentum. You see a team if you're 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 influencing that game, a uh -huh. team is getting ready to go on a run. Yeah, I mean you will. Somebody's hot is in the zone and oh. drain everything. You just cut yeah. their legs right off. Oh yeah, by calling a couple ticky tack fouls and it's you know so they got to come out because they got three I'll fouls look, early. Like, I'll say this. Yeah. So so I think this is a silly argument, but here's why: not because I think it's dumb, but because it's human nature. Whenever you have a lot of money yeah. or a lot of potential power, yeah. um, and there are people- It's almost always going to be corrupt. And there are people yeah. that can influence yeah. the direction of, of, of that power or that money, 
you're going to have corruption. You're just, it's human okay, nature. You know, name so name an industry. Yeah. No, it has his you beer. Know, hey, okay, imagine all the uh, people are just one. Just like, name one. Leave my sports alone. Yeah. Like politics are corrupt. Business is Nothing corrupt. Is pure. Business is corrupt. Medical don't touch my sports. Corrupt. Nothing is pure. Dude. You don't have, uh, unless we had like angels, like that, were like yeah. actual angels running, like being as referees. It's not going to make how unfortunate and sad that is to think that. You know it's just saying? human nature. You have yeah. to accept it. This is why, okay, it's like yeah, there's, government. There's like degrees of it. It's like know? government yeah. regulation of, of industry that people like, we need more regulation. You do realize the more regulation we put, and I think some regulation well, you know what you're, is you're, necessary, you but the what, more you put, the more bro, you are, power you're you are using a perfect analogy mm -hmm. for how it's how it is played in in business. Yep. Like literally, regulations are refs. Yep, that yep. is the refs That's exactly in, the influencing yeah. the game in the game of life. That's and always business. been my argument. Yeah. yeah, imagine this. Imagine if you had you had ten NFL teams, okay, and other teams were being developed, and they're like, we want to get into the NFL, but the current ten NFL teams are like, well, we'll create the standards. Yeah. that you have to meet in order to come <laughs> yeah. into the NFL. What kind of standards do you think they're going to create? Yeah. Impossible to meet barriers. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is how regulations are created in industry. Yeah. Regulations are created no star players. by the current big dogs, and they make it so that it's impossible for new competitors to come in because otherwise they got to compete with more people. Mm -hmm. Big business loves regulation. So the purest, way loves to, it. the purest way to play this game then is like good old street ball, call your own fouls, and then when you get in a fight and <laughs> argument, you just fucking... Duke it out. Duke yeah. it out. <laughs> Say, man, the man, ball never lies, dude. That's yeah, my bro. rule. That's the way to keep this shit yeah. pure. Get rid of the refs. Get let them the go. Ball. You call your own foul. You get fouled. You disagree. You guys or get into it. Let you, the viewers vote. All right, here's the foul. Okay, what so, do you guys think? Yes or no? Hey, based off of that, <laughs> I okay, I'm like right now I'm like racking my brain around like all the sports. Like so it's there, there are there are some sports though that are 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 probably much more difficult to influence. Basketball and football for sure easy. Yeah. But like Hockey a little less, tennis mm. even more or less, golf. Like how are how are outside forces influencing that? That's I'm not saying that there's not the more right, rules, the more rules, more players, the, and the, well, I mean players, more players and more points. Yeah, That's what so more it. rules, more players, more points. The more ways you can manipulate. Yeah, them. yeah, definitely. less rules. Yeah. So like a street fight, no rules. Well, whoever wins wins. That's it, right? <laughs> yeah. But now you put them in the cage, and there's some rules. Now you have some ways to influence. No, stop right there. Illegal hit. You're holding them too long. Whatever. The more rules, this is business as well. This is why market regulations tend to be some of the best regulations because who determines that? The consumer. You do a bad job, I don't buy your stuff. You do a good job, I buy your stuff. That's that. Now, I'm not saying we should have no regulation. I think there should be some, but that's just what ends up happening. The more the, more the refs can influence the game, the yeah, more the refs become a part. Rigged, yeah. They become a part yeah. of the game. So people are always like, how do we get money out of politics? Like, you know, presidential elections will cost like, billions of dollars. It's like billions of dollars to, to get one right. guy or the other person to win. And you want to know how you would, you know how you get rid of, of that money immediately. If you got government out of all markets, there'd be no, there'd be no incentive to give them any money because they have no. Influence. Yeah. But going back to my record, you have to have some. Yeah, exactly. Somebody would make the argument is like, come on, that's as ridiculous as I'm thinking that you're going to play example. sports without yeah. refs and you're going to have people cheating all over the place. And it's like somebody, maybe has we'll to. have AI. I mean, refs. That, that honestly, that is the, well, that's probably where we're going. I mean, a hundred percent. And then what it'll do is it'll happening. show the foul and then it'll, Dude, it'll we play already, what's going we on. Already, look how fast you can yeah, but AI's watch the game biased. live. How quickly us as viewers get to see that play replayed in slow yeah. motion. And all you have to do is put the parameters, plug it in uh, to the the AI, and then AI makes well, here, the call and judgment. And then it's non-biased because it's I'm gonna AI. Find, I'm going to find the turd in the punch bowl already. All, now, AI can actually manipulate the video just enough, and you'd never know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep <laughs> fake. I mean, dude, <laughs> have, you seen, hey, have you heard about these celebrities that these like uh, influencers that are like freaking out because people are sending them porn? Oh, with them with, in it, yes, yeah, it's like yeah. CGI their face, really. and it's like, like, and they're like Whoa. crying and traumatized, and it looks just like them. I saw these was it fans only accounts that are like they look like real girls, like the real people, but they're not. They're just completely made Bro, up. Oh, that's what I want to do. And and they speak. Well, let's and make everything. an only fans page that's not even a real. They're not even real. And, and, what do you mean? Let's make. You think we're the, that was your idea? You're the first person to think of that. That shit's happening, bro. Yeah, they're that already making happening. that. Yeah, it's like, and, and people are getting totally bamboozled by these like what fake a, girls. What a brilliant! And idea. nobody's gonna care. Some dude That's on right, the other end, dude. just like, oh, did baby. you hear that Jordan Peterson little clip today, yeah. like talking about that, like where where the pornography is going with AI? 
And he's like, you're not you're, gonna you're, care. You're, they're, they're not going to care. No. God, men are so superficial with looks. As long as it looks, if it, yeah. you if know it what's passes funny about the look test. Yeah, but you know what's funny about that? What? They say it's just, it's men. You know what? They're going to do the same thing to women. It's just going to communicate a little bit differently. It's, like, it's going <laughs> to fool them differently. It, no, it's not going to be, it won't be looks. It'll be like the way it communicates to them. It'll yeah. like, be like words of affirmation. Yeah. Oh, tell, he, tell me you're more so gorgeous. He understands. You're so smart. Yes. You're so he understands me. I'm here. He feels me. talking. Yeah, you know what I mean? He really knows what I'm saying. He understands me. He validates everything I say. We are fucked. We're gonna get out competed, everybody. No, I. You know, you said something that sounded ridiculous a while back that I think is is, is pretty spot on. I think that um, things will be labeled, you know, organic, right? Like, yes, I think, dude. I think that, uh, and there'll be and yeah. there'll be a market for both, right? Just like there is right now, where a lot of people still say fuck that organic stuff and they shop all the regular stuff still and save the extra money. And then there'll be some people that are like, hey, I'm willing to pay a little more. Yeah. Uh, for the people that I know well, are real, that I'm talking to yeah. another human. You ever try to hey? You ever try to grow your own vegetables or your own like like fruit, and you look at it, and you're like, this doesn't look like the stuff at the grocery store. Right? Why is it carrying so hey, small? Trip on the, <laughs> hey, trip on this for a second. Yeah, now, dude. will this actually? This could be like a, here's a, here's the positive spin on AI. Is will this now make us appreciate the flaws in each other more? Like right now. Like what do what do people do online? Smash others for sure. typos or making errors or like putting people down. No, because I think it'll engineer the flaws. I think it'll figure exactly. out. Exactly, it'll figure out just uh, just enough of the flaws that you need to believe it's real or to like it. Well, you heard that in uh, what video was that? The guy was talking. Um, he had AI for one of his his voice yeah, recordings, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it and it give the ums and the pauses. Yeah, he, and, he did. Yeah, he did yeah, like yeah. some. Imp imperfections that were added like specifically to kind of fool you that way and they're already thinking of that stuff it's crazy we're gonna have to make it's gonna be funny because yeah, regulators know. are gonna try and regulate it good luck there there are you're gonna see you're gonna see workers and people lobby government to ban ai whatever for their field mm -hmm. and they may get laws passed because they have a lot of voting power but it's now it's there Okay. Good luck. So, so are we going to talk about the monkey in the room or what? what, what it's the what's, elephant in the room, but what about the, tell me about the monkey, though. <laughs> Monkey's better than elephant. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the monkey's more It's a 500-pound gorilla. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. There you go. Analogies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you ever, hey, we're going to talk about the elephant gorilla? The hybrid elephant gorilla? Are we talking about I, that I elephant fucking the gorilla over there? What's going on here? <laughs> hey, let's, staring at hey, me let's talk weird. about Hey, let's talk about the UFO. Yeah, let's talk about it. Justin's been itching. Come on. All right, you ready? You ready for me to be the turd in your guys' punch bowl on this one? No, wait, relax. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, dude. Let me hear your spiel first. Let's just talk about the facts first. The facts first. Give me the turds. There's been four. Four, like confirmed, reported. Uh, I think up to four now, maybe five. Over Canada, over Michigan, the one that got shot down. There's one. Like, oh, there's one in China. Are you including the balloon in that one? Huh? Are you including over the balloon? No, like, no. Like Huron? Or yeah, oh, like, yeah. These are actual. Like it was a cylindrical object. We we you know fighters intercepted it. Like countries. Yeah, they got shot down. Yeah, and places are all simultaneously reporting, and their militaries are saying. We don't know. They're, they're the military is saying this. We you don't know, know what it is. There, Will Smith did a from. movie about this, in case you guys are wondering. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is one good movie. It's, it's, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's just, so. back, okay. All right. Here's the turn of the punch bowl. I, it's all bullshit. Okay. Here's it. It's all bullshit. But. To, 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 to Why do you think that's a turd? Okay. I, I yeah, bet you, like, you don't even ask how we feel. We've been saying that the whole time. Come on. What do you, what do you mean? You, you guys are saying it's a UFO. I'm saying no, it's no, nothing. No, no, no. It's not UFO a UFO. A Chinese balloon. Oh, we're a bunch of kittens like batting. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're just literally doing like the most ridiculously obvious yeah. ways to distract us. That's it. Yeah. A balloon. That's yeah. It's like. Like you, you don't think China already has satellites surveying <laughs> yeah. us? They have yeah. people on ground, you know, like taking yeah. all our information. Well, you know, like, they, yeah, they, they, they infiltrate us with TikTok. They yeah, don't need a like, fucking but who the hell cares about a balloon? Dude. balloon dude. What did they invent? Like, what did they invent balloons? <laughs> yeah. Man, like it's so old school. It's, you know what? Though? We it's, caught a carrier it's pigeon perfect from Russia. to get all of us idiots arguing over it, though. I mean, that's what the, like this. All of this shit is to get all of us right. talking about it, debating why. Meanwhile, well, what the, are the, the real yeah, shit. Well, here, now here's but, why. But this is all escalating. I guess yes. is what I'm trying to yes. get to. Okay, because like, yes. the, the original wasn't enough. Yeah, because like, <laughs> dude. Okay, so 1994. Right. <laughs> well, you got researching. Dates? No, this is when. Yeah, this is when this whole like Project Blue Beam and this whole you know like, what Project Blue Beam is? Of conspiracy came out. Tell you, me, you don't? Of course I don't. I don't subscribe to the same Rebel conspiracy magazines that you yes. guys hey, do. 
Hey, right now, conspiracy theorists are like 86 and zero. I think it's time for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. Time to pay We're running out of them. So tell me Project Bluebeam. So it's it's this government, it, like NASA, and um, so they all were all working together to basically create this like simulated alien invasion, right? With like lasers in the sky. So creating holograms so you could actually like create uh, UFO looking objects like in the sky and like, it, they were speculating that this was a way that they could like kind of simulate an invasion and then gain control of the population. So the way. guy that came up with this, uh, his name was Serge Monast yeah. and he was a writer and investigative journalist from Quebec and he published a manifesto explaining the theory that he called uh, Bluebeam and he said it's a four-step project. I have, oh. a, I have it all saved oh, here. Also, uh, so Star Trek had a script that they pitched out to for this movie and then in Hollywood actually rejected the movie and it was literally like this exact script and, and they actually wrote a book about it later but it was like how they brought these religious leaders first to kind of um, mm. bring down and kind of persuade everybody to subscribe to this new religion as the aliens were invading Anyways. so 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 check this out so the four-step project was designed by NASA and the United Nations, which would allow these organizations to accomplish what he believed to be their ultimate goal of creating a new age religion led by the Antichrist in order to start a new world order dictatorship. So that, so Project Bluebeam was a system of advanced mind control as well as top secret technology to trick everyone into believing there's been a second coming. Part of it would be to display religious leaders all over the world, so like Buddha, Jesus, whatever, and also to right. show That's right. a UFO or alien invasion, essentially getting people to to organize Unite. a new world yeah. order yeah. type of deal. So distract and, and divide for as many years as possible to then make it, you know, this ultimate way of unifying everybody under some new religion. Now, here's what's crazy. This is 1994. There's other elements of this. Like he said, for example, that part of it would be to get rid of cash and to use digital currencies, which is kind of interesting. That was in 94? Yeah. yeah. Wow. 94, yeah, dude. dude. And then he died mysteriously, by the way. They, now, his family says he disappeared, but it was reported that he had a heart attack. But anyway, kind of weird. So here's, here's, I don't know if I believe in this, but I do think it's interesting that why would our military be like, yeah, it was a UFO, everybody. Isn't that weird? I feel like they wouldn't say that. Like yeah, they're they like keep playing into it. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's that's what got my bells and whistles off. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's why I've even felt like the whole you know China balloon. You know, like like why that's would the they dumbest thing I've ever heard? Like of why, life. why 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 are we all why are we all excited about a balloon? Yeah, uh, and, and and why announcing it like that, and then also delaying the taking it down. I mean, it just created. You know what? I would be really interesting is I wonder how much didn't, like didn't they shoot it with a missile? Was there like more Pfizer reports? Oh, we missed didn't they shoot something? the balloon with a missile? No, you know what? You know what I, I feel so, like yeah. all I do is like all I have to do is like shoot throw a rocket or something. Yeah, like they the shoot without they without Trump with. COVID starting to drift away as far as the news cycle. I feel like we haven't had There's any, no boogeyman. That's right. There's yeah. nothing there. And so it's Putin's like, kind of yesterday's news. Yeah. So I feel like it's like, I, I wish I knew how much like, okay, when a, when, a, when a Trump comes in or when, when COVID hits, like how much money does do all the networks make for getting eyeballs on you? Like mm. it would be really interesting to see what like you know like let's say like a, a normal year of news let's just say yeah. of like your typical yeah. stuff and then like pandemic level trump crazy level and like and how much more eyeballs does that draw on on like news mm. networks and ad revenue and it'd be really interesting to see like how much money is to be how had much revolves around that right yeah, cuz then you then you have to ask yourself okay if it, if we're talking about hundreds of millions maybe even billions of dollars like and to think that maybe the the government and news networks aren't involved in conspiring to create just stories to create stories you know what the big, to so here, stay paid here's stay, the biggest counter the biggest counter is like oh it would take too many people and too many countries and too many organizations to work together to do this. To that's not true. No, yeah. you don't need, that's to, not true. You don't need you, them all working together. No, all you, you need, need is small groups from each place. All, and all you got to do is plant something that you know is going to go viral. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So now here's the other side of it. The UFO people say that. Who are the UFO people? Like the people that are like all about them, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, they usually people. have crazy hair. We have, and, yeah. uh, <laughs> we have one in the room. No, they, so the UFO people say that. Just look off in the that, distance. That, that, the, that UF aliens 
monitor us. They leave us alone, yeah. like we're a like we're a protected habitat, right? Like, <clears throat> like a yeah, like a national a zoo. park. Yeah, they watch us, and they're like, "We're gonna step in if these you know, primates primates <laughs> decide to kill themselves." The monkey in the room, and maybe and this, so some of them are like, "Hey." Uh, maybe we're getting close to actually destroying yeah, ourselves. Send a couple ships over there. Maybe with AI or with nukes, who knows? And so now they're showing up and then pretty soon they're going to step up and be like, hey guys, guess what? Uh, we Game's gonna, over. Yeah, we're yeah, not- Get back to your cages. Yeah, we were- <laughs> <laughs> you guys- Oh man. <laughs> we weren't going to do anything, but now we got to yeah, step in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are about to kill everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Stop cleaning your room. Uh, I don't oh, know. No, it no. is crazy hey. though. I mean, it's funny too, because I'll see these articles like UFO was this, UFO was that, UFO was shot down. And I'm like, Justin. I'm like instantly sending him to him. He's like, already seen uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And my head is just like, oh. Oh, man. Like, I can't take any more of this stuff. All right. Let's take a left and get into business. Um, so here's something that we accurately reported on and predicted. And I remember at the time, we had friends of us that said, we're so wrong. You guys don't even know anything about this. In fact, we had the CEO of the company come on the show to discuss to us why we were so wrong. Yeah. Turns out we might have been right. Uh, tonal. What's ah. going on with Tonal? <laughs> oh, God. Remember that? Ooh. Oh, revenge is so sweet. No, dude. No, no, so no. Sweet. Yes, News it articles is. coming out. I, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if any of you had gone back and look at the, I actually did today because the article came out because I was like, oh, I forgot about this. No, I didn't forget about it, but I forgot about the conversation that I had with my boy, Brendan. And I went back and like reread the thread. I'm like, boy, he went in, he went ham on me, dude. Yeah. So I was like, you know, mm. Normally I wouldn't be petty like this. Just, <laughs> I would let I would let it I would let it slide oh, and be like, yeah, chalk one up, another one for mind pump. You know yeah. what I'm saying for predicting some shit. But I'm like, this motherfucker went hard on me, so I had to post in my story and tag him and be like, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. So what happened? They, they they're, they're gonna so their valuations they, so dropping. they're gonna they're, they need money. Okay, they're bleeding, so they need money. They're gonna have to do another round. When they do this round, the evaluation is gonna come in at you know they're saying north of five hundred million plus less than what it was. Wow, a year and a half, two years. So ago. the story goes, what happened? And was, on that, and on top of that, oh, they're talking about letting go of the CEO. CEO yeah. Okay, so here's what, so, that, so here's what happened. This was during was it during the pandemic? This happened? Yeah, or? it was. Okay. The, it was. The, I mean, they were they were around before. Yeah. But that they and they were taken off already before, but then the that they, really accelerated. So they got things. this valuation that was a billion dollars. Yeah, All of us that was like two point something. Or something it was over yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like two billion. Yeah. All of us in here thought that was insane and ridiculous. Like, and they kept and the argument was, oh, it's this new technology or whatever. But we understand exercise. And we know I don't care what your technology is, the bottleneck or the challenge is always gonna be. Can you get people to stay consistent yeah, forever? Yeah, the adherence. That's it. I don't care how fancy it is. I don't care how great it looks. If you can't get people to stick to it, which is a problem that we have been trying to figure mm. out in the fitness space Nobody forever. Nobody solved it. Yeah. Then you're not going to, then this valuation is crap. And we said that. We said that on the show, I think twice. And the CEO of Tonal heard it, came on the show to debate and discuss with us, talked about how sticky his members were. And all of us were like, uh, we'll see about that. And it turns out, that we were right. And, and sadly, you know, I, I hate to say that, that. Yeah, no, of course. I don't think any of us were rooting for the collapse of no. it. I think that we we were just speculating on it. And of course, I, I you know, ruffled some feathers because my buddy is an, a, a big investor, right? So mm -hmm. he's he's closely tied to it. Nobody wants to hear like, hey, you know all that money you just gave that company? Like yeah. totally overvalued. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I get why he defended it. But I mean, at the same time too, like it was really clear to us uh, uh, what we were looking at. Now, if- it smelled like every other fitness. Yeah, if, I mean, if we would if we would have used used it and been like, oh my god, this is new science, new breakthrough. This is going to change everybody's life. Different story, but I mean, new equipment comes out every every year, every month. A, a new piece of something comes like out. The same and, problem always pops. And up. you know, it was funny because I still get people that you know DM me like, oh, I love my tone. I'm like, I'm not saying it's not cool yeah. to have, and uh, if you're rich, it's cool too, and you can afford to. Drop. There's nothing wrong with the tonal equipment. Yeah, There's I mean, nothing wrong uh, with it. Well, I mean, you, it, not if you know how to deadlift well, legs. or squat. Legs well, yeah, okay. if you want legs. Yeah, no, no. What I mean is, what I mean is, it's okay. Nothing wrong with it in the sense for a workout, you know, thing. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the problem is not uh, inventing new cool ways to work yeah, out. Yeah, no. The problem is, yeah. how do we get people to create a lifelong relationship with exercise? Mm -hmm. And new equipment will not do that. It's not an equipment problem. No. And here, look, I've yes. run gyms. That were Human new. Psychology. I've run gyms that were old. 
I've run gyms that were whatever. And the difference was always the team and the staff and the people that had nothing to do with the equipment. I'd run old gyms that would outperform bigger, better gyms because it was all about how we made the members feel, how we could keep them to be consistent, how we could coach and train them. So unless you can create, and maybe this has happened, it's going to come soon, a an incredible coach, which we were just talking about AI, maybe that'll happen. You'll have your fitness AI coach that's like an expert in psychology and how to like really get you to really understand, you know, what works or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to figure it out. The stick, the stickiness is going to be the same as it is with dumbbells, as it is with bands, as it is with, with whatever. So that's why tonal. Yeah. Is no, now yeah. I think, I think it's, I think it's uh, just a matter of time. I mean, you have Mir who their competitor was, it was bought out by Lululemon. Yeah. Uh, instantly cut their, their price. I think there's like 700 and something dollars for it. So, I mean, they got it. They better hurry up. I mean, Mm. They're they're selling theirs at like thirty five hundred dollars for the tonal machine, and then their membership monthly is thir between thirty and fifty dollars a month. Like that is unbelievably expensive. And then you have these other competitors that are selling and the very similar product. If you have a good relationship with exercise and your body, you need no equipment. You literally need no equipment, and you'll be yeah. consistent. And yeah. you'll and, you'll, and that doesn't work. mean you like these things aren't. I mean, we have we have a, a tonal in the gym, yeah. um, inside here. Uh, granted, it rarely gets used, but it's in there, right? And they gave it to us. Yeah, if you have if you have disposable income, where having a piece of four thousand you know dollar equipment on your wall that you could grab. I mean, we we promote trigger sessions all the time, right? I mean, I would love to have a tonal mounted on the side of one of my walls, and I just go over there and grab it every once in a while and do a little trigger session yeah. off it. And I think it's cool. It'd be really cool for that and it takes up hardly well, any can space use bands. yeah and you could <laughs> yeah. the tonal looks cooler right yeah, yeah. it looks cooler and is and then you can you could do more stuff on it than just right. a set of bands and so yeah but i mean for the average person and to your point the reason why we're obese is not because we have a lack of certain gym equipment or accessibility to certain gym stuff no. like we can get in shape with no equipment whatsoever so that it's what we always knew. And it's yeah. like, this is, and the price point for that just didn't seem no. realistic. All right. Staying on the, on the kind of health and fitness front. I, I saw a post, uh, on Twitter the other day and I'm, I'm realizing that the argument around ultra processed foods, because we know ultra processed foods, you know, not good for you, promote obesity, et cetera, et cetera. The argument now is starting to get twisted. And I think it's being twisted because the, processed food market is probably trying to fight back. And so here's how it goes. It goes like this. Ultra processed foods can be very healthy. Look at these foods over here. Look at the macros. Look at the proteins. Look at the fats. Look at the carbs. This is a very healthy ultra processed food. And that completely misses the, the problem. The problem with ultra processed foods isn't necessarily the fact that they're inherently unhealthy. Because it is true that some of them are healthier than others. That's not the problem. The problem is that ultra-processed foods are engineered to make you overeat. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. And healthy food is unhealthy if you overeat it. So the fact that it can be healthy, that doesn't matter. It's the fact that most of the research and development and money that goes into ultra-processed foods goes into making them so desirable, so addictive that they overcome your, your ability to know when you're full or, yeah. or, or when you have satiety. And unless you're tracking every calorie or gram, you're yeah. not going to know if you go based off how you feel. And the studies are clear on this. If you go based off of how you feel, you'll end up eating five to 600 more calories a day. And that, that'll make you overweight, which is unhealthy. And it doesn't matter if it's healthy or not. Yeah, you got to increase that bottom line. I mean, if you're a business owner and you're in that space and you know that consumers are definitely drawn towards the like very distinct features, like it's either like a real sweet flavor, a real crunch, like a salty, like something that's like, you know, uh, an experience that they want to, you know, they want to get after like more of that. And like, it's, it's almost a compulsion at that point. That's the money desired outcome is like, I want to feed that because then I'm going to move product. So it's just in their best interest to do that when we know that that affects our, us in terms of our own behavior of how we approach food. All of it, all of it goes into making the food irresistible. Everything from the color to the taste, to the, to the texture, to the 
residue it leaves on your on your fingers, the aftertaste. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't even think of all the things that go into it. But if you look at the majority of ingredients uh, in ultra-processed food, they're in there specifically to improve or increase uh, palatability. And so they've become right. ultra-palatable, hyper-palatable. And so what happens is we have these natural governing systems because there's this like myth that humans are eating machines. And if you just put food in front of us, we'll eat until yeah. we're obese and sick. That's not true. We have uh, signals that tell us when we're hungry. We have signals that tell us to stop eating. So technically you could very well become obese on healthy food on, on, should I say, excuse me, non-processed whole natural foods. You can become obese on it. It's just way harder. Mm -hmm. It's way harder. You'll hit palate fatigue. You'll hit satiety much sooner. Ultra processed foods, you don't. And so this is what makes ultra processed foods, and that's what makes them unhealthy. It's not the ingredients. It's not the fact that there's more sugar or calories or whatever. It's just you overeat them. So you could have the exact same macro profile and the same calories. If your diet is ultra processed foods, you're going to want to eat more. If it's whole natural foods, you'll want to eat less. That's all. That's just the bottom line. So that's the argument and that's the discussion we need to have. Because otherwise what happens is they twist it and they say, well, ours is healthy, but ours is whatever. By the way, I'm not trying to demonize it all and say never, you know, never eat it, whatever. I'm just saying be aware because I and think there's some value. You're dealing with there. That's there's, look, there's value in ultra processed food. It's got long shelf life. It's convenient. Like you could travel with it. I get it. But uh, don't let them make the wrong argument. That's a that's an old technique that people will use to get your eyes off of the actual problem. And the problem is not that it's healthy versus unhealthy. The problem is it's it's super palatable. And if I eat a lot of it, I'll just overeat. Do you guys do you guys have some like rules that you that you use for how you use or implement processed foods? Because obviously everybody in here use eats processed foods. So we're sitting here telling people right. Whole foods, whole foods, whole foods, and that doesn't mean that all of a sudden some somebody could take a picture of us, you know, eating some processed thing out of a wrapper, right, right. and mm -hmm. you would catch us and, and red handed. Like we don't do that. Yeah. Everybody in here, uh, at one point, either in the day or for sure in the week, consumes some sort of processed food. So how do you, how do you reconcile that? We, like you you present, hey, this is the way to eat whole foods. Yet you know you utilize processed foods. So how do how do you would you guys keep uh, rules or do you guys have like oh if I do this then I'll allow this or oh I pay attention when I eat this I only will do this like how do you manage that and allow it to come in and out of your life Yeah it's not I don't have any hard rules yeah. but I would say um the vast majority of my diet is whole natural foods so the vast majority of my diet is like one ingredient type of foods with seasoning um so I almost always never have a meal where it's ultra processed foods, uh, especially not on a, on a regular basis. That's just bottom line. Most people, it's the opposite. Most people, if you look at the average, about 70%. So if you look at all the food they consume, 70% is ultra processed. I think if you flipped it and made it like 10 to 20% ultra processed and 80%, 90% whole natural foods, I think that would that would solve. Oh, I think if so you just flipped it and did seventy thirty, you'd be okay. Yeah, I think seventy percent whole that. foods and and thirty percent because of course, uh, you know our our prepackaged oatmeal that all of us eat on a pretty regular basis that's considered right. processed. It food, is, you know, the protein bar that Doug, that's where Doug, I get, Doug yeah. was eating just a, you know an hour ago. The beef jerky Justin was eating yesterday. I mean, I so get there's caught up with that stuff, the snacky stuff, or like if I'm driving and then I will get something with protein, like a you know a bar. Uh, on my way, that's usually where it sneaks in, but it's it's sparing. Like as long as it's in that sort of sparing category, and I pay attention to patterns more than anything of like what I'm doing constantly every day, because um, you know that's where it's like okay, if this keeps coming up and I it's sneaking its way in, I have to like address that and then you know make a different uh, decision based off of that. You know that's a little more leaning to whole foods, but the main majority of my meals are usually whole foods. I set it up that way. And then that kind of just sneaks in every now and yeah, then. Yeah. That's kind of my thing. Right. So I, I try and always make sure I get like either th three to five, because that's kind of the range of how many meals I eat in a day, whole foods, like three to five of my meals right. are, you know, prepared by Katrina and I, or I've bought it from somewhere that it's, it's a whole, it's whole food, right. And steak, rice, or like I was eating earlier, uh, beans and steak and, and tortillas and stuff like that. I'll do things like that. But 
if I'm on the go or I'm like in a hurry, something like that, and I want to have a protein bar or I want to use the oatmeal or the beef jerky as a snack in between those whole meals, like it's not a big deal to me. But what I want to stay away from is like processed meal followed by a processed meal. Like to me, that leads to a really tough time with appetite control. That, and that's the, that's, and by the way, I know because I've done co competitions where I've tracked and measured and it doesn't make that big of a difference in my pursuit of fat loss. So long as I'm perfect on making sure that it's the You're same tracking, tracking, right. But what I've, the, the discipline to stay tighter on the diet is harder just because mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't, it actually does not suppress the appetite like whole foods do for me. When I eat processed food, like my body goes right through it. I'm hungry. Start again. reaching yeah. around for other items. Yes. Or you want to eat more of it. And so that, that's the, the bad part of it. And I think that's the part that people have to accept or understand is like, nobody is sitting on here trying to demonize processed foods. hundred percent, all of us in here utilize them, but be aware of how your body breaks that down, uses it and what it does to you when it comes to appetite control, mm -hmm. which that is that it has a, a direct effect on your behaviors. And we talk about behaviors all the time being like the number one thing that is going to cause you to gain weight or lose weight. And so if you're constantly consuming these foods that impact your behaviors, then you're naive to think that, oh, it's all equal. Yep. It, you know, yes, it is on a macro perspective in calories, but they're not all I, equal. I have a rule that if if I if I am gonna eat uh a, a processed food meal that it's protein heavy. That's the one thing that I'll do is I'll, I'll choose a protein heavy processed food because protein by itself is more satiety inducing. Um, that doesn't mean that the processed food isn't also still going to make me hungrier, but if it's a majority of protein, if it's a high protein, like a beef jerky stick or something. Yeah. You're not going to, you, you typically don't overeat that, right? Unless it's uh, because of the protein content, you no. know, type of deal. No. Um, speaking of whole natural foods and, and protein, um, we're mentioning butcher box today. I want to ask you guys, what's the most common? Cause I have now switched my box and a lot of it is, uh, the tri-tips. I eat a lot of tri-tips. Do you mm -hmm. guys find yourself going super variety or do you find yourself going like tri -tips, two or three? New York steak, a lot of beef chuck, like, you know, for burgers and whatnot. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll do that just because of the versatility of what we can make with it. But that's usually big in my box. Yeah. I'm thinking. terrible. I'm like the same thing. Like, Which what is it? Yeah, so I do. Their ribs are, I think, the best. You still do that all? Oh, the time. they're they're rib they're they're pork ribs. I and I have actually tested all kinds of other it's other the heritage places. Pork, dude, it tastes oh. different. Swear to God. And, and and I don't know. They they cook the best. They fall off the bone. They're like so. That's consistently in there. We actually get our chicken from there too. So we do. So the, I would say the pork ribs, the chicken, and then we normally have a couple uh, fillets in there are probably the, my standard box. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, we'll, Katrina will try. She did something recent. I don't remember what what she. I do tons out. of tri tip, tons and tons of tri tips. They're just so they're, they're they cook real easy, real well. Slice them up. They're good. The next yeah, day. I'll have to ask her if the last time that we've done a tri tip from yeah, there. Good. But I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quite the creature of habit. Once I have like something that works, we're using all of yeah. it. It's like same here. Yeah, I, I have to like go in there and actively change. Speaking of appetite, um, a peptide is making huge waves right now. <laughs> oh, dude, semaglutide <laughs> yes. is blowing up everywhere. It's okay. So I was just while we were talking, really? I was trying to find the damn article. Somebody somebody DM'd it to me to to ask me about it. And I'm like, oh my God, we, we already talk about this. But the article had me rolling because it was promoting the 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 it said like uh new weight loss jab that is all the all <laughs> right. And you read this to me, I was cracking up. Yeah, and then the, the, the it says, you know, this has become this is known to be unbelievably or super effective when paired with calorie restriction and exercise. <laughs> <laughs> when you're actually doing all you the right know, things, hey, you know what else works really well with that too? Water, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. water paired with fucking yeah. calorie restriction. Yeah, calorie wow. restriction and exercise, and guess Anything. what? You're gonna get in shape. So to be fair, okay, not not to be fair, semaglutide happens to be probably the only weight loss whatever that I've ever seen that actually seems to work. It actually seems to work. So in the data, they'll give people some agglutide and they lose 10 to 20% of their body weight without trying to do anything else, without trying. Now, I think you're going to be, a doctor would be irresponsible to not promote anything else, but it's seen, it causes weight loss by itself. Now, how does it do this? 
I mean, you could go through all the complicated, um, improves insulin sensitivity and, and glucose management and all that stuff. But one of the big reasons is it just makes you eat less. You, okay. Your appetite is reduced. Okay, so, take so it. it's an appetite suppressant. Okay, so yeah. right now- But it's now, not a stimulant. It's not like taking something that makes you wired or anything like that. Okay, so because it's a peptide, explain to me what stops um, a Pfizer from patenting their version of this, naming it whatever they want to call it, and it becoming- It's already pat It's already owned by a company, I believe. I want to say, I think there's going to be pharmaceutical companies selling it. Yeah, these peptides get uh, patented, right? I, uh, as they I believe so. So, so we interviewed a, 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 an expert on peptides. That episode will be coming out uh, at some point, but he explained the difference between peptides and drugs. Peptides are signaling mechanisms between cells that we've identified already. So they're natural mm -hmm. signaling mechanisms. Whereas drugs are created uh, in order to force a cell to do what you so want. So then, be right. based so off of that, I would think they're not patented. That's what I. That's a good. Exogenous. That's a good question, Adam. Maybe Doug, you can put up some glutide and so, see if a pharmaceutical company's selling it or what the deal is. Or so yeah. So what, are they patented? Right. Right away, what I think is that okay. The, here, something like this uh, door opens, and you know, you leave it to a company like you know, Pfizer that has an unbelievably marketing power, arguably the most yeah. powerful company as far as its marketing ability to reach more people. You rebrand it for whatever name you want to call it because, and then I don't know if you add something to it or change it a little bit to be yours and then patent it or, or it's included in, mm. you know, something. And now you have got this, the, the most powerful weight loss drug that we have seen well, and we now opens the door. Well, here's it. what's interesting about semaglutide from what I'm reading is it's not a stimulant. So other appetite suppressants in the past, remember Fen Fen and that kind of stuff? Mm. It would be like taking a, a stimulant, right? So that's why ephedra would do that too. Yeah. Mm. Semaglutide doesn't do that. It doesn't seem to wear off. So it always, it'll suppress your appetite. It also is muscle sparing. Here's what's really crazy. In the, in the weight, the weight loss is mm. fat loss. It's not muscle loss. So it has some muscle sparing effects. I don't think it's a miracle drug, but it's the closest to a fat burning, whatever you want to call it, that is I've it ever seen. to the insulin sensitivity? It, that and then the appetite suppression. So mm. it has some muscle sparing effects through that. And yeah. then I think just through the the fact that it makes people- You know how, you know it's an even simpler way to know yeah, how effective it is? It's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, I think it's, it's like a thousand or 1500 bucks a month. It's not factor. cheap, dude. That's why like, like, mo like most people- Oh, that actually works If probably. most people could get their hands on real HGH, right? They uh, would yeah. take it with, I mean, most all of your super famous actors are all yeah. on oh, doctor yeah. prescribed yep. HGH. It is literally like the youth hormone. It's a fountain of youth yeah. to get a hold of that, but it's ridiculously expensive. You, this is up there in expense, right? What'd you find, Doug? So it is patented by Novo Nordisk. Oh, okay. And there's a number of different uh, brand names. Though. Can we, can oh, we Zempic, it? Wagovi. I did already. Yeah. You did? I did. I bought it a while ago. I bought some shares, I think, in Novo. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Can you look at the ticker for us? You did not tell us. Uh, of course I, I did. I think it's just Novo. You tell us afterwards when you made your money. No. <laughs> <You're just saying? laughs> it's like you did. Hey, by the way, you should have. You guys. What was the, yeah, you what got you, this. Yeah, yeah. What was, the, what was the big one you cashed out on? The, uh, I, that the, was before I knew you guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, I bought that one. I didn't GW. Yeah, GW. No, so, uh, so talk, speaking of growth hormone, growth hormone releasing peptides are going are gonna to probably crush growth hormone. So instead of buying expensive growth hormone, you buy inexpensive growth hormone releasing peptides. And rather than you know, messing with your hormone system and potentially causing things like insulin resistance or whatever, yeah. your body just makes Produce more of its it own. Yeah. And there's a limit. You're not gonna make so much that you, you know, you 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 cause problems. When so. I was talking to the guys at Transcend, I don't know how true this is or not, but they were making claims that that using that could is like similar to taking, I think two IUs. Yeah, I think he said two to four IUs I read that. of a, a, a H. Oh, you read that too. Yeah, so they look. At I, so when I when I I've taken HGH several times, and and there was definitely a time when I believe I had some watered down China shit, and then there was time when I had like the pharmaceutical grade. Yeah, and when I was taking the pharmaceutical grade, that's all I took was like four four or five IUs a day, and you could definitely feel. I don't think you'll get up to four. So when I'm looked at the studies is, but what, even what I'm saying though is that like you really I felt. Four to five yeah. IUs, like. Are you time. doing? You're doing the growth hormone releasing peptide now, aren't you? 
Did I haven't start started it, yet? it, but I got it. I know why you haven't started. You just yeah, don't want to mix it. it. I got to mix it. I just <laughs> haven't had time. <laughs> I mean, that was just like two days ago. Give me, give me some days here. I'm gonna. I'll yeah, bring it. it. I'll do it for you. Well, I got the. I'll uh, mix it up for I you. I can do. I mean, I I do my own ACG and I've done all that stuff. So I just gotta do it. Like, <laughs> I gotta get. I I started the Dehexa. I started the um. What was the other? C Max. C Max. And I started the um. What is the other one that I they have me? Oh, on uh, DHEA. So mm -hmm. I have DHEA, Dihexa, and then the the yeah. CMAX or yeah. the three of them. I have no idea what they're all for. So, but if, I'm taking so it, if you go, so we there are partners. So if you go to mphormones.com, and then you can do a consult with them and talk to them about some of the stuff. And they have, they I mean they can work with all these different peptides. It's very interesting. It's very interesting when you look at the data on how they work. But yeah, growth hormone releasing peptides, from what I've seen. When they show the rise in growth hormone, it's equivalent to like one and a half, two IUs of growth hormone. So not bodybuilder doses by any means, but enough to where you're going to get like this youth effect. So if you're over, you know, 35, 40, after three, four, five months, you should notice a difference in things like your skin, hair. You, we, you should caution stuff. people though. It's not cheap. Like there's, it's, I don't think I've seen one. Some are more expensive than others. I know some of glutide is expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, I think some of the growth hormone releasing peptides are a lot less. But I mean, look, here's the deal. There, there's, it's still not, it's still not. No, well, I know people that spend hundreds of dollars on bullshit supplements that do nothing. So pep, the peptides, especially when you're monitored by a doctor, they work. So it's, it's a different. Well, I mean, different I, I mean, the, the truth is, I mean, no, you pay for what you get and something yeah. like that. It's obviously expensive because it freaking really works. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to get away with selling it for that expensive if it didn't work very <laughs> yeah, well. It just dude. doesn't, it doesn't happen. But no, I'm, I'm curious. Like I'm, uh, I'm on day four. Four, three or four of that, and then I'll I'll start the um, what's it called? The growth hormone releasing. Yeah, thank you. What's it called? What's the actual? Tessa Maryland, yes. Maryland mix. Tess, it's Tessa Maryland. That's it's what both. It. It's, so they mix them. So together. okay, so Tessa Maryland is what I'm taking now. Now I've taken IW. Uh, no, I is different. Okay, so tell me what's the difference because I I, I did. So I, Tessa Maryland, Ipa Maryland is the combo that they gave you. So it's both in yeah, one. Okay. Okay. Ibutamorin simul is similar to ghrelin. And that'll raise growth hormone through a different mechanism. I've tried all of them, right? So I'm doing the Tessa Maryland, Ipa Maryland right now. And before I did Ibutamorin, Ibutamorin made me hungry. And it felt like a mass builder. Like I gain size on it. I get crazy pumps, but it makes me hungry. So if you're trying to go on a cut, I don't, I could not, there's no way oh, I could do a cut. On a on bulk, it would be awesome. On a bulk, Ibutamorin would be amazing. And but it makes, so what I noticed cut, from I it, could not. I slept like a baby on it. On Ibutamorin? Yes. Yes, yes. The Tessa Maryland, Ipa Maryland, much milder is what I'm noticing, but I'm not getting the appetite uh, uh, boost at all. It, so, which is I, again, if you're trying to maintain your, does your, it matter when I take that at night or morning? You're supposed to take it at night to okay, mimic so, growth hormone. So similar to that, but I take it first thing in the morning because I work out fasted. I don't eat anything for like three or four hours, so I take it first thing in the morning. And the reason why I do that is I notice it, it actually interrupts my sleep at night. So I have it. So I, now I've heard that from people. Some like, people that'll, that'll that'll be the yeah, case. I was talking to my mother in law. She's taking it, and she was saying that she noticed it keeps her up a little bit. Yeah. And so I told her it's not that big of a deal. We take in the morning. They they recommend just like HGH. They recommend so at if you time. you don't want to eat like within a couple hours of it because if you eat anything that releases insulin, then you'll blunt the effects, and it's like taking nothing because insulin and growth hormone. Yeah. Didn't each that other. doctor say that when we That's were? That's right. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Doug, do you know when you're you're going to release that yet? Do you have any idea on the dates? Uh, I don't. But it's going to be in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. That was okay. a really that was uh. I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't excited about that episode, mm -hmm. but I really enjoyed the conversation. It was yep. super informative. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think you, I think in the next 10 years, peptides are going to blow uh, most, uh, many medications out the water. That's like mm -hmm. the next huge frontier. Hey, we work with a company called Organifi. They make plant-based supplements to improve your health, athletic performance. They have supplements like a green juice that's really effective, making you feel better, especially if you lack vegetables or greens in your diet. They have plant-based protein powders. They have a gold juice you can drink before you go to bed for relaxation and a red juice, which is stimulant-free energy. By the way, speaking of stimulants, uh, they have a new product called Peak Power that you can drink before you work out or before you need any creativity. It's got some caffeine, but also has some other botanicals in there that improve the feelings of euphoria, energy, and creativity. Anyway, go check this company out. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump, use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Dan from the UK. Dan, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. You um, got it. First off, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, listening to your podcast. I also picked up Sal's Resistance book. 
um, and both have kind of really helped shape my understanding of fitness and what I'm trying to achieve. Um, so my main question is around, um, basically, I was recently listening to an episode where you guys were talking about four different types of strength training. Um, and I'm wondering, is it possible or even advisable to attempt maximal strength training five days a week, Monday to Friday, without causing aches and soreness or kind of risk of injury? Um, and just if you have any suggestions for someone who's trying to transition from moderate intensity resistance training to maximal. Yeah, well, it depends on the person and how and how their body feels. I mean, uh, there's definitely people that can train five days a week f for maximal strength, um, but uh, other people, it's just too much. You're really going to have to feel it out and see how it works. Most people, Dan, do best <coughs> about three to four days a week. Five days a week tends to be too much of uh -huh. uh, high intensity type of strength training. If somebody does go to the gym five days a week, you're usually looking at two of those days being more recovery, mobility focused. So more along the lines of supporting mm. the other hard three days. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can train for it five days a week. You just, you'd have to you gotta undulate your intensity. Yeah. You just got to manipulate the intensity so that the goal can be maximal strength and I'm going to lift five days a week. And, and the, so the program, as far as the rep range, the exercise choice, the, the mindset going into the workout looks very similar, but you just scale back the intensity on at least two or three of those days. Otherwise, you're going to be just be doing so much damage. Your body's constantly trying to recover and, and never adapts. And again, this depends on the person, right? Yeah. So because you may find a sweet spot for yourself, Dan, and then find that that at some point in your life becomes too much or that you can do more. So yeah. it's, it's just, you know, you know the, the, the key with long-term success with exercise in general is to to ask yourself why you're doing this. Yeah. Is this is this improving the context of my uh, is this improving my life, the quality of my life in the context of my life right now? So that that will help you adjust the intensity, the volume, the frequency up or down yeah. based on how you're feeling. But let's get more details, Dan. What are you doing in that five days a week right now that's making you yeah, feel what's the way your you are? very specific goals and what are you trying to get out of this in terms of like ramping up um you know intensity that many days in a row is it mainly strength driven yeah. or is it endurance driven sure i'll try to give you guys some more background so i suppose my ultimate goal is body recomposition to tr and my understanding is to achieve that is through building muscle um to try and improve my metabolism um to lower my body fat percentage um, and I, the reason I go five days a week is largely because I enjoy the mental benefits a lot. It's a really nice way to start my day and I do moderate intensity so that I can turn up every day and, you know, n also avoid injury. Cause that's something I'm really worried about. Um, just cause in the past I had pushed myself a bit too hard and then, you know, hurt myself and then that would mean time off. So yeah, that's the kind of place I'm at okay. uh, coming from. Okay. And are you following a specific program? So, um, after listening to the resistance training revolution book, I checked out the, um, YouTube channel and built a playlist for myself out of those videos. So usually some priming and then a bunch of those, uh, strength exercises. Um, and I'll mix it up day to day, depending on how my body's feeling. Okay, Dan. But right now you're saying you're feeling uh, more aches and pains and soreness than you, than you feel you should. Yeah. So previously at moderate intensity, it was fine. Um, after listening to that episode, it seemed to make sense to try and increase my maximal strength. Um, so I wanted to give that a go, but after like two or three days, I thought, oh, this is just too much for me and not sustainable. Um, okay. so I think what you were saying about maybe the days in between, just lowering it, taking it easy or fo focusing on mobility instead. Yeah. The other side of this is your, is your diet, uh, as well Is are you hitting, protein targets and are you tracking your yeah, are calories? You in a cut? If you're in a cut, this makes it even harder. Um, yeah. Um, so I've only been tracking for a few weeks, so I'm still trying to get used to the numbers. Um, I carbs and fat tend to be split and I try to weight it towards protein. So maybe around 40%. Um, and let me just try are, to think. Are you hitting your body weight in protein? Um, so 190 grams at the moment. And do you, so my, my body weight is 82 kilos, which is, I think is about 180 pounds. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, you're that's, that's good. And sleep is good. So here's what I'm going to do, Dan, because we do provide people with 
all of the information that they would need to design themselves a good program. That doesn't necessarily mean they'd be able to design themselves a good program, though. So we're giving you a lot of the ingredients, there's a lot of explanations, mm -hmm. but putting the pieces together, um, you know, takes a, a, another kind of level of experience and expertise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you one of our programs. Uh, I'm going to send you Maps Anabolic, and I think Maps Anabolic oh, wow. is going to be perfect for what you're trying to accomplish. You could go to the gym three days a week. In between those days, you'll do trigger sessions. One of those trigger mm -hmm. sessions can be at the gym, and then you could just do things like mobility. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that will probably give you exactly what you're looking for. Amazing. I really appreciate that, guys. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. Th thanks for calling in. No worries. Take you, care. You got it. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the thoughtful uh, questions that way. And, you know, he's obviously thinking his way through this mm -hmm. and kind of listening to his body. Because I know a lot of guys would just go through and be like, yeah, this hurts, but I'm just going to keep pushing. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad, you know, we have someone like that uh, on the show asking the, those types of questions. But you should, a little bit of soreness is okay, but you should feel good generally from your workouts. If you feel fatigued or excess soreness or achiness, that's not, you know, what, what do they say? Pain is weakness leaving the body or whatever. <laughs> like that's not, that doesn't mean you're moving in the right direction. You're, you're probably, you're doing too much somewhere, whether it's too much volume too much intensity, too much frequency of workouts, uh, or all three, you should feel generally good. You should feel generally recovered and you should see incremental progress in things like strength uh, and performance in the gym. What do you think the percentage of, you know, motivated lifters like this, someone who's doing his research, building this program, you know, getting after it. What, what do you think is the percentage of people that uh, are more likely to, uh, over apply intensity instead of under Someone like him who's a motivated kind of person, yeah, I would over. say a higher yeah. Yeah, percentage. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, of course, higher. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying, I, I think, okay, like when I think about- I would the, say a majority, but- Yeah, I I, when, yeah. I think about, when I think of pool, the pool of my clients that I had, in the, and if we had to divide them in two categories of, you know, the, the really motivated, want to get after it, you know, group, and then the group that was like, you know, really challenged to even get yeah. to the gym yeah. and, you know, really doesn't like exercise. So if I were to divide them in, in two main groups like that- the group that it you know never really worked out doesn't really like to work out doesn't really want to work out but knows they need to work out i tend i, I would say that a majority of those i always had to kind of uh, encourage more intensity or increasing the yeah. way or you know oh, we got another rep we could do or we, so that, that's what i'd say about like in 80 percent i'd say we're like that and then the same is true in the other group but in the direction of over app, uh, applying intensity mm -hmm. right i'd say that the group that is like really like they're they they're excited they're they're motivated they're they're willing to dedicate five six days in the gym mm -hmm. um, they're doing their own research on on what they should be doing building their pro I would say that eighty percent or more of those people actually tend to over uh, apply intensity well yeah. and the overachievers too like I used to try like if they were like five six days a week or they just live in the gym initially as a younger trainer, I'd try to like kind of scale that back and be like, you only show up like three days a week. Like you don't really need to do all that much, but you know, later on realize you just need to keep them busy. Uh, and yeah. two active recovery is a big part of that whole yep. uh, process. So to, to have them just understand that you have to taper off that intensity and really like go through the movements, but, but approach it with a more restorative, um, type of energy. And so to keep them busy though, was crucial because they're so driven yeah. that they just need something to do every day. I, I, yeah. I actually had clients like that who would sneak in workouts. Yeah, they do it anyways. I'm like, what are you doing? But you know, you know, what is probably most common for everybody is, is they do both. What I mean by that is they'll get these little spurts of like motivation. They just overdo it. And then long bouts of like underdoing it. It's very hard to find to, to get someone to understand the proper application, which is neither too much nor too little, and how to read those signals, how to read how their body's progressing, how they feel, and how to determine. And by the way, advanced, experienced training or trainers or, or, or people find this balance to be challenging as well. But um, you know, it's even harder for someone without experience. They tend to overdo it and then burn out or hurt themselves and then way underdo it type of deal. So. Our next caller is Josh from Texas. Josh, what's happening, man? How can I help you? Awesome. So I'm going to go to my question first and then, you know, show my appreciation for y'all uh, afterwards. Um, so 
Real quick and simple, the question is, how does one determine their genetic limitations or gifts? So kind of how is there is there any test somebody can run on certain types of body parts? Like for me personally, I like to believe I have small muscle groups. So kind of like the traps, the calves, because I remember Adam you used to say you used to work your calves every day, you know, because you were insecure about them. Right. Uh, so I kind of felt the same way. And so there was like a whole month where I was spending all my calves, you know, whenever I was hitting upper body, hit calves. Like I would always throw in calves. I would start off with my workout and I would do the same. And so I like to train boxing and kickboxing, right? So you're kind of using your arms a lot. So I like to, and my forearms, I feel like boxers tend to have bigger calves, you know, from jumping rope all the time, right? Um, and then also smaller forearms too and traps. So it just seems like my small muscle groups tend to not grow with, uh, they get defined, but they don't tend to get that, like that girth. So I don't know if it's a programming situation, my diet, or if it's just genetics. So, and if there is, if there are tips to work out these small muscle groups, like for my biceps, I feel like they're hard for me to grow because I got a short muscle head, right? Um, I've even tried doing weighted, uh, reverse grip pull-ups for my biceps. I've done seated calf races, like jump ropes for out, like minutes on time, like 10 minutes at a time. So just kind of having trouble with these like small muscle groups, if that makes sense. What's, uh, what's your, are you boxing right now? How, how often are you training and how much are you, how much are you boxing stuff? Give me an idea. So I, my new job schedule, I'm working four days. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., right? So uh, a long shift, don't get home. So I make sure to get my sleep and my nutrition. And so I, I eat pretty clean. I eat like 90, 10, I would say. Uh, you know, I eat like, Sal, actually, you got me to eating like four to six. I know you eat like eight eggs in the morning, but I eat like four to six eggs, pound of ground beef a day. You know, that's like the staple. So uh, tracking maybe 18 to 2,000 calories. Uh, so that could be a possibility, uh, but I'm only five, seven, about 150 pounds. So, um, and my training, I usually start off hitting the bag for like 30 minutes. Uh, and then I'll have days where weekends I'll do, you know, a few hours of training, um, kind of get what I can and then do like 45 minutes of weightlifting. Yeah, yeah bro, you, you, uh, you already answered your question for sure. Um, the, the amount of activity, cardio, and training in relation to the amount of calories you're eating is probably why you're having a hard time building. You're just, you're burning a ton, bro. You know, that's a, it's a, that's a lot of cardio. That's not a lot of calories. And to expect those, those small muscle groups to, to really grow is going to be is going to be tough. It's going to be. It doesn't mean you can't and you and you won't over time, but it's going to be a much slower process than if you would actually dedicate a you know training cycle to bulking and building those muscle groups. Right now, you're sending a competing signal with probably the high intensity cardio. You're eating lower calorie. You're training quite a bit. Like yeah, it's a lot to ask your body to also build in an area that you already know are kind of stubborn areas for you. So if you really really want to build those those small areas calves try you you would want to dedicate a a, a program or a you know cycle of few months of yeah. bulking and training to build Strength muscle building primarily yeah. yeah add add a thousand calories a day to your diet watch what happens 500 to a yeah. thousand watch what happens but look I'll, I'll tell you this here's the the big question right the big question that you asked because i'm gonna kind of i'm gonna narrow it all down and kind of synthesize it to this which is 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 my lack of progress due to my genetics or is it due to my training, diet, and lifestyle? Here's why I don't think that question ever needs to be asked. Because if it is genetics, there's nothing you can do about it. So, so why is that important? Because why focus or worry about what you can't control? It's not like you can change your genetics. So the question should never be, is it my genetics? The question is, well, what can I do? Or what do I have control over that can potentially move me in the right direction? That's the, that's the real question. Genetics are there. You're born, mm -hmm. you, you didn't choose your parents. Um, so you've got those genes. So then look at your training, look at your diet, look at your sleep and your lifestyle and what are things you can do. And right out the gates, number one, 
Adam hit the nail on the head. Eat more, eat more calories. Now you might find it's hard for you to eat more calories because, uh, you might already find that you're kind of feeling like you're stuffing yourself now. If that's the case, add liquid calories. That's a real easy way to do it. You know, shakes in between meals or a big shake right before bed or something like that. But you add another five, 500, 700 calories a day consistently to your diet. You'll put on some size. You'll gain a little bit of size for sure. Just from doing that. Yeah. So even good. So I do check my protein. I do eat about 150, sometimes 160 grams of protein. So I make sure to get my protein. I don't know if that helps me maintain my muscle that I have, or yeah. if I even just just yeah, it helps. overall. It helps. No, if you're you're hitting your protein targets, which is good, but your calories can still be too low. Yeah. Okay. okay. So protein is important, but so are calories. You got to have you got to have both because if your calories are not enough to gain any type of size, you're just going to burn what you're consuming, even if your protein intake is high. Now, high protein intake is going to take your total calories or whatever you're eating and nudge it towards muscle. So in other words, if you eat 2,000 calories low protein, 2,000 calories high protein, if you compare the two, high protein is going to be more effective. But nonetheless, you're finding it's challenging to gain weight That just that, and your protein intake is good. You just add more calories. And I mean, you can do it with more protein, fat, or carbs, or all three. At this point, I would say add, if you, if you find it difficult to um, to eat more, like, let me ask you this, Josh, Are you, do you feel like you can eat more or do you feel like you're already like kind of stuffing yourself? I definitely feel like I can throw in a 500 calorie shake for sure. Just because my job, I am walking quite a bit. So I'm not sure how much calories I'm burning, but I'm walking probably close to like 20,000 steps. Oh yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah, that's why you're having yeah, a time. Yeah, I, I really think it's it's a matter of your training right now. Like I, if you if you haven't really like abruptly changed a drastic change in terms of like there's two different types of muscle fibers that we're working with here and like to to shift it over more towards fast twitch and to be able to really work on the strength training block and building like a building phase uh to to develop these muscles that you're seeking um you know you're you're not going to see a whole lot of movement in that direction if it's you know distracted a lot by the endurance side of the training so uh you know if this is something like you really desire this outcome uh, to abruptly stop it and shift that training completely in that direction is, you know, something to really consider. Yeah. How important is it to you that you you maintain your boxing and that you're, you know, that you you keep doing that? Is that something you really enjoy doing? Uh, yeah, definitely brings me happiness. Definitely have to, definitely have to have it in there. Okay. Uh, what up my lifestyle I'm trying to build is around boxing, like my future uh, goals and plans and aspirations whatever you want to call oh, really? it really so you have you you have goals of 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 boxing uh like maybe professionally at some point um actually not necessarily i've competed before uh it's been a while because you know work and all that uh but i actually want to start coaching people okay. in boxing kind of like a structured around boxing kind of uh give people to get, get them into exercises based around boxing kickboxing you know martial arts in general oh cool so how many days a week yeah. how many days a week do you train in uh in boxing and kickboxing so i work for four days i don't get off until about like saturday morning so usually the weekend saturday night sundays and mondays and tuesdays more tuesday morning before I get back to work so about four days four days a week of of uh what what is it, like an hour an hour worth of boxing type training Said a half hour. About an hour of weightlifting and about 30 minutes or so of a uh, hit bag and mitt work or doing some sparring. Oh, and so then, on those four days, you're doing an hour of strength training and then 30 to 40 minutes. He of starts the work out with half hour of hitting the bag. You missed that yeah, part? Yeah, no, I got that. I'm just trying to get or even, even more probably now that I think about it truly like being honest, like probably close to another hour, like because my work day is so like those 12 hour shifts, I just like kind of prepare for work milk prep my food when i do have time for the gym it's like dang he's i just want to throw it all in there yeah, yeah. Know, lots of steps on. throughout the day yeah yeah I, I do you know so you're doing that four days a week the other three days a week should be uh recovery based so don't do any more working out bump your calories and then you'll yeah. see yourself gain some size that's it I mean, there's a way to gradually get to your desired outcome. So to be able to incorporate the skills of boxing and not, 
you know, uh, dismiss that or put that aside in terms, if that's like your priority, obviously we're going to need to incorporate that. So, uh, but those other days where you're just exclusively focused on strength training and building, you know, that's, that's, you know, kind of where you need to go. Would you suggest a type of, uh, like our type of, you know, strength type of like five by five or, you know, like my weight lift, is it heavy weight, low reps? while I'm doing, you know, the, the, the boxing type of workout. I actually think that maps 15 would actually benefit him. I think Let, let's I send think, you maps 15 yeah. and cause you might be doing too much strength training, to be honest with you. Just, he, too yeah, much of well, everything. And combo and out. everything. It's yeah. tough to, to kind of parse that. I mean, yeah, it, it, the strength training exclusively, like that day should be just by itself. So, um, yeah, I, in terms of the skill, we, we'd have to also be able to kind of taper down the intensity of when you're doing your, your endurance type training, but yeah, like what they're trying to get to is like how can we how can we structure this in a way where your body's not doing too much? So like kind of reducing, I guess, the the time length. And that's where maps 15, maps 20, I guess, on our advanced blueprint with that uh, would make sense uh in terms of like strength training and then the other days you're you're doing your skills. Yeah, I'd I if you're gonna train, if you're gonna do your boxing on the same day you're doing lifting, I would definitely like to see you do the boxing after your lifting, and I'd like to see you refuel between. So I'd love to see you do like a shake. Uh, you know, right after your lifting routine, uh, before you go into boxing for a little bit, and I don't know how much that you're going to like that as far as how it'll. But I mean, you, you the amount of activity at you the got, least drink some carbs. Yeah, I mean, I just think that the amount of activity that you're doing, we, we you need to support it with some totally some more calories, and 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 if we can scale back intensity, like Justin's saying. So, yeah. <clears throat> we'll awesome. s- we'll send you mass fifteen, so you'll have something else to to look at and follow. Okay. Awesome. Thank y'all so much. You got it, man. Right on. Yeah. My appreciation that last time real quick, uh, as a young 20 year old kid, uh, I really look up to y'all about, you know, just more than health and fitness, more kind of a good person. Uh, and my biggest goal, honestly, in life is to be the dad I've never had. And y'all are like perfect role models for me. I take your advice to heart and, uh, I just picture myself being a better dad to my future kids uh when i'm older and y'all teach me like you know money investing too uh y'all just helped me out a lot just being great influences for a young a young like me so thank you so much oh, thank thanks, you josh that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge compliment thank man. you man thank give you me, give me emotional at the end there yeah <laughs> <laughs> this this is the classic uh, want my cake and eat it too, yeah, right? But I mean, you, hey, man, you know what though? I mean, he's got a tremendous uh, athletic performance ability to be able to do all of that. Um, I've I've worked with boxers. He's and young and resilient, so it's hey, kind of one of those things. Yeah, but he just got he's got to eat more, dude. Yeah. He's just not eating enough for all of that activity. Yeah, that and or just uh, understand that. The, the goal, take, right? the, yeah, the goals are competing, yep. you know, uh, the, being a great boxer. And obviously that's very important to him. So you never want to be the, the coach who's like, Hey, stop boxing. But the truth is, if you really wanted to build your traps and calves, cutting out boxing and limiting that, uh, or, you know, really pulling yeah. back on the intensity, increasing it's calories, be the most effective path would be the most effective path to get there. But like you, you love it. Like, so, yeah. okay. But then you have to be a little understanding that, I mean, how many, uh, boxers do we see that look like bodybuilders? And by the way, the ones that do are anomalies. They have those genetic, they had those, they probably looked like that when they were 12, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So, you don't see boxers. I usually don't bet on them. <laughs> usually the ones that get Except for out. Evander Holyfield. He looked like a little. Well, yeah, that's the exception. You know, here, in, along those lines, when you look at an athlete and you look at their body parts and you say, oh, it's the sport is causing that. At that level, what's happened is they're genetically built in a particular way that, that gives them an advantage at that sport. That's why they look the way they do. It's not that the sport develops. So, you know, he talked about calves. In fact, if you look at boxers, they tend to have high short calves. Yeah. Kickboxers tend to have long calves. Why is that? Well, you're a kickboxer. You're kicking. You want mass on your lower leg to give you more power. You when you're a, a boxer, support. Yeah. yeah. And when you're a boxer, you short, just like sprinters, you see they typically have short calves as well. You want mobility. You want power, but you want mobility. That doesn't mean if you kickbox, you'll, your calves will get longer. If you box, your calves will get shorter. They're just built at that level. When you look at that level of athleticism, you know, that level of performance, you're looking at people who work hard, consistent, but they also have the genetics that that puts them in a category that makes them better at that particular sport or built better for that particular sport. So and I, I, I want to make that point because as a kid, I did the same thing. I would look at a sport and be like, oh, that's 
Yeah. I got to do that sport to look that way. No, that's not how it works. Our next caller is Andrea from Indiana. Andrea, how can we help you? Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question today. I've been listening to you guys for a while and really enjoy the content. Um, also, I recently got the RGB bundle, which I'm digging. So again, thanks, Tom. You guys are doing great work. Awesome. Thank so you. my question is regarding nutrition. Um, I've been tracking my macros for about six years. Uh, and for the majority of it, I generally follow, followed a 40% protein, 30% carb, 30% fat diet. Um, and I'm very routine based. Uh, so I eat pretty much the same thing every day, except for occasional vacations and holidays. Um, and so I'm just curious if there's any advantage to changing up your nutrition plan outside of changing the amount of calories. So more like in terms of macro percentages or types of proteins. Oh, good. Ab absolutely. Great, great question. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, there, there, there definitely is value. There's a couple places where you'll find value. One is in learning how to read the signals. Because when you get so caught in a routine of, of eating in a particular way, you tend to um, lose touch with how your body feels eating other things. Okay, and that's, that, potentially. So I see value in people trying different diets to see Wow, when I go really low carb, I notice improvements in my cognitive performance. Or when I bump my carbs, I have uh, better performance in the gym. Or when I switch protein sources uh, from, let's say, you know, uh, turkey to ground beef or to fish, I notice more or less inflammation or better recovery or better digestion. So there's that. There's also um, potential, you could potentially be developing food intolerances from eating the same things over and over again. So let's say you have a little bit of gut inflammation. Um, that could cause proteins or amino acids to leak through the gut, and you could create some kind of mild immune reactions to the types of foods that you eat. This is why you'll see people with gut issues when they do gut testing or intolerance testing. They'll find that all the things that they eat, they're intolerant to. Well, it's because they eat them all the time. So their body's now developed kind of this immune response to those types of things. So wellness professionals or experts or people like Paul Check, who I would consider to be the godfather of the wellness space, advocates rotating food specifically just for that reason. So those are two big reasons why I would I would say it's 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 a good idea to rotate uh through those things. You know, I used to love to take um my clients through like all all popular diets. Uh and then as we'd go through that process, I'd be constantly questioning them like, you know, what do you feel and what do you like about this or what do you don't like and because I think in our in a in in the context of your life, you know, not always being exactly the same, I tend to like to eat different ways based off of my situation. So you know, you you I incorporate intermittent fasting sometimes. I incorporate a higher fat diet sometimes. Sometimes I go uh, high carb, low. And so as you get to rotate through these different diets, you start to go, oh, you know what? Like I don't have to be eating this way exactly the same all the time. I find value in, mm -hmm. you know, ro changing the diet up today because I'm going to be flying all day long or I'm not going to have access to a lot of things. So I'm going to, or I know that when I eat uh, uh, with more carbs, I tend to crave more foods. And so when I'm trying to suppress my cravings, I'm going to try, you know, a higher fat, higher protein. Like, so there's, there's a lot of value in doing this, aside from also just, you know, like Sal said, with potentially uh, eliminating foods that you could have an intolerance to that you don't realize. Yeah, I do want to give you credit, though. I think um, as trainers, we try to get our clients into the uh, phase where you're in, in terms of like understanding your body on that level of like what works and, you know, where your homeostasis is in terms of like what uh, you know, your, your meals consist of that works best. But now, you know, after being there for so many years to be able to optimize that and kind of go venture in these other directions, cause there are, you know, um, diets that, that, that lend better towards different benefits. And so to be able to kind of, you know, maybe introduce something different for, uh, you know, brain function, health and all that, and then come back and, and get back to your regular routine. I think, you know, there's, there's, there's got to be some benefit to that as well. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Like, I'll give you an example, Andrea. If I know that I'm going to be on some big podcast and I'm traveling, I will eat a particular way to that I've identified for myself that maximizes my sharpness, my cognitive performance. If I know I'm going to have a particular type of workout and or I want to hit a PR, then my diet will change based on that. Uh, if my sleep is off, if my digestion is in a particular way, then I'll adjust my diet in those ways. So basically what you're doing is you're taking, you're getting a much more broad whole picture 
of how your body is affected by different foods. Um, so when you do change to something else, pay attention to how you feel. Don't marry it. Just pay attention to how you feel. And then, you know, throughout the your, your entire life, you'll get a better idea of how to eat based off of the context of your life and your goals and kind of what you're looking to accomplish. It's a really cool place to be when you do it that way. That's kind of the the route towards like what, you know, what I would, you know, for loosely define as intuitive, intuitive eating. eating yep. Especially since you've been very consistent with, and you really have got your, your macros dialed and you've been doing this for a long time. So it's, it's easier for someone like you to measure how these, these different ways of eating is affecting you versus somebody who never eats consistently at all a certain way. Yeah. It's hard for that person to pinpoint, oh, wow, when I do increase this, I really notice the difference in my sleep yeah. or some of the things south of So it's actually, like Justin said, you're, you're in a great place because you have built this consistency uh, of tracking and paying attention. So now to start to manipulate and play with that, like you're the perfect client to really make them become more aware of, of you know how they're eating in, intuitively. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't realize that you could actually develop intolerances just by eating the same thing. So oh. I'd, I'd be curious to find out. And what I think I'll do is just a throw lot. it on a 180. Like I eat a lot of eggs. I eat a lot of ground turkey. And so maybe filtering in a lot more fish and uh, ground beef and just see how I feel. So Along those lines, it's actually almost always that. It's very common. And it's yeah. and it's almost always it's the, the favorite food. That, foods. Yes, yeah. that we wouldn't, you wouldn't think. So uh, that's, I think that's one of the most interesting things. There's many, been many times where I've had clients who didn't realize that the food they eat every single day that they thought uh, agreed with them didn't so much. You know, the, the, there was like this thing, like, you know, I'd have a client who'd be like, yeah, you know, I just, I always feel like I have this little bit of a pooch or I just, in, unless I'm waking up first thing in the morning, my stomach's flat in the morning, but then I just feel like I'm bloated kind of all day, but not real bad, but just kind of, and then all of a sudden we change a food that was a favorite food or a food they eat every single day out of there. And they're like, oh my God, I feel so much leaner. It's like, well, we didn't lose a bunch of body fat in three days. But what we did was we eliminated something that maybe your, your body, and it doesn't have to be a massive reaction. Sometimes it's very subtle like that but then they see a difference in, in the way they look and feel. Yeah. Awesome guys. Thanks so much. You got it. Thanks for calling in. Yeah. To go a little deeper into that for people who are like, huh, how does that work? Like why, why was, why does that make sense? So um, when you have slight gut inflammation, which can be caused by lots of different things, lots of stress, over exercise, lack of sleep, hormone changes, whatever the gut is affected by almost everything. When you have a little bit of inflammation in the gut, the junctions in the in the wall of the gut, you get a little bit of spacing in between them, and they become leaky. This is the term leaky gut syndrome, right? Uh, the medical term now is uh, intestinal wall hyperpermeability, I think is what they'll say. And so when you have a, a little bit of space there, then when you eat foods or you know amino acids, particles, whatever, markers of the foods that you eat can go through the gut when they're not supposed to. And when your body sees that, it identifies it. Oftentimes, it creates an immune response. It's like it's it's like, it's like call it's like an invader. It's like a call to arms. It doesn't have to be a big reaction. It can be a very minor reaction, and you can almost get used to this reaction and not realize that the food that you're eating is causing this until you remove it, and then all of a sudden you feel less bloated, more energy, just generally better. So this is why the foods you eat all the time are typically the ones that you'll develop an intolerance to because they're the ones that your body is is mounting this reaction to. So switching them out allows your body to give, kind of give it a break. It brings inflammation back down. Um, and then you can reintroduce those foods again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always always thought it was a good idea to rotate food anyway. And like, I, I always like the idea of trying to, to go with what's in season in terms of like, because nature just has this way of providing the right types of nutrients for uh, certain seasons where you don't get a lot of sun or, yeah. you know, like there's a lot of like colds and viruses out there and like things to combat that. So uh, to kind of follow that natural pattern, I think is something to consider, but it is a lot uh, more mentally uh, simplistic to, to keep this kind of regimen yeah. of what works well there's also uh micronutrients and yeah. eating the same food if you eat the, even if they're good foods and they fit your macro profile 
you're eating the same kind of micronutrients all the time. And there's benefits to lots of different micronutrients. And so what you might find is that you're, you're not, and that, and that it's not enough to make you fat or yeah. not be able to build muscle or whatever like that, but You'll your body, feel it. yeah, your body may be craving and needing it because you are low in it and you don't even realize you're low and you don't think you're doing something wrong or bad because your macros are in line. And simply by rotating through that food and getting something else mm -hmm. introduced in there, you pick those micronutrients up and then all of a sudden you go, Oh my God, I feel a little bit better. That's weird. My macros are the same. I'm not doing, I'm doing the same training exercise. Oh, well maybe you were lacking in these micronutrients because you ate X, Y, and Z all the time and you needed this and now you got it. And so you feel different. Our next caller is Billy from New York. Billy, what's happening? Hey guys. Uh, I want to just say thank you for uh, for all the information and uh, entertainment you provide. Been an avid listener last couple of years, so thank you uh, for for all the laughs and all the information that I can get from you guys, whether that's through fitness or anything else going on in the world. You got it, man. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, Billy. So, uh, so I had a question about first steps to get into the industry. Um, should my main question is, should I get a personal training certification or go the nutrition route and get a level one certification with uh, NCI? A uh, little bit of background, I've been working out consistently the last three or four years at a big box gym. And I know some trainers at that gym, they all have their CPT through various uh, certifications. But I've also listened to your show a while and I've heard plenty of people say they get more out of you guys than those certifications that they studied for. So as an outsider trying to get in the industry, I kind of look at the CPT as like a necessary evil. Um, and then I also had a call with somebody at NCI about their level one certification, and I am intrigued by that. Um, and I'm thinking about going that route. Um, so I guess, and I know you have a working relationship too with, with NCI and hold them in high regard. So can it be a hindrance for someone not to have their CPT or is that overblown or what are your guys thoughts? Well, what do you want to do? Good question. Mm -hmm. You want to work at a big box gym, train people in person, or do you want to coach people online? Yeah. I, at first I was undecided. And the more that I've, I've thought about that, I, I think training people on online would be pretty cool because kind of just like this call, you can talk with anyone from, from anywhere in the country or, or the world for that matter. Okay. Um, that, that's, and, e that's easy then. Yeah. Yeah. NCI. So here, here's why, a lot easier to here's why I go NCI. If you're going online, two reasons. One, the vast majority of training you're going to do online, uh, virtually is going to be through nutrition. <laughs> It's really hard to train people virtually, you know, fitness wise. Um, now, when you're working with someone in person, you're going to want more uh, of that kind of biomechanics understanding, form understanding. Plus, it's a requirement anyway. You go to a gym, they're going to require a national level, you know, what they would what they would consider a national level certification. So NCI, I would is easy for that reason, and also because NCI, and this is why we work with them. They teach coaches how to be successful. Yeah. No other certification does this. You go get NESM, ISSA, whatever. They'll teach you exercise. They'll how teach you some trainer. program. Yeah. But yeah, how to how to you know not hurt someone and stuff like that. They teach you zero or almost zero on how to build your business. NCI will teach you how to build your business, and that's the biggest gap. That's like the the, the biggest thing that the industry lacks is trainers get certified, then they get thrown into the space. Nobody knows how to build their business. How do I and, make it a sustainable income and, yeah. and you know, support myself? Like yeah, those are like the most important factors. And NCI is actually one of the only certifications I've I've seen that is really addressing that wholeheartedly and and has like a lot of success stories uh, to back it. So yeah, I mean, this was the main reason why we partnered with them. We we knew uh, years ago. Um, the direction the fitness space was going uh, as far as online coaching. Uh, we think they're the best in the industry in that. So that was kind of the no brainer partnership in a perfect world. I think, I think having uh, both though would be you know, most beneficial. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that the value you do get from, uh, you know, built program building and, and going through like an actual national certification, but if it was like, uh, I got a budget, I got a certain amount of money or time to dedicate towards this right now, where would I go first? Oh, yeah. The stuff that you're going to get from, you know, NCI, especially considering that you, you've already said that you're going to start or want to do it online. Like yeah. if you were going into a gym, you would need the national cert. And so that would be the obvious but uh, you're going to get a lot of a lot of what you need just from NCI alone, and then the fact that you listen to the show. I mean, I think we talk a lot about you know uh, program design on the show, so you get probably a good chunk of that from us. 
and then NCI is going to really fill in the gaps. Yeah, I think, and I, and we recommend. I mean, it kind of varies on based off of like uh, what you're trying to do, uh, what we would recommend. But in terms of just like a general recommendation of national certification, I still think NASM is probably one of your best bets in terms of just like a foundational understanding of anatomy and physiology, and like you know, at least gives you a lot of the uh, the the higher like understanding of of what you're trying to do. But in terms of programming and really getting to that individual application, um, I think CPPS is your best bet. Yeah, with that. Joe DeFranco. Yeah, Joe DeFranco. Yeah, Joe DeFranco's will do that. Here's what I'm going to do for you, Billy. I'm going to help you out, okay? I uh, Maps Prime Pro and Maps Prime are extremely valuable to trainers and coaches. If you don't have those, I'll send those to you because you'll find those very valuable to work with people online. So it's not going to teach you how to do a squat or a bench press or a deadlift. I'm assuming you know how to do those basic exercises. You've been working out for a while. But it is going to teach you how to uh, do correctional exercise, and that is very valuable for any trainer. So I'll send you those two. And I, I'll say this, Prime and Prime Pro are as valuable as most certifications, in my opinion, for a trainer who at least has a basic understanding of exercise. If you have no understanding of exercise, go with the certification. If you have a basic understanding of exercise, Prime and Prime Pro, in my opinion, are more valuable than most uh, certifications 100%. in terms of 100%. Yeah, application. Absolutely, hundred percent. So I'm going to send you those two, and those are those are worth more than than uh, some of those certifications. And then I would go NCI. NCI is going to teach you how to be a good online coach and teach you how to build your business because there's a massive, massive percentage of certified trainers who don't train clients because they couldn't figure out how to make it a career. They just couldn't figure it out because nobody taught them. Nobody coached yep. them. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to have a conversation too with my, my former trainer. He actually was the one who, who put me on you guys. He, he would use some of your videos when you would walk through like the form of an exercise. So when I first started working out from home during the pandemic, um, he would send me those clips of you guys walking through that stuff. So that's how I first got onto you. And, uh, now I just I just bounce back and forth between uh, anabolic and performance for myself, and uh, yeah, just perfect. Kind of want to career change and uh, feel like this would be a good good place to start. So thank you very much. Awesome, you got it, man. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in some of those coaching sessions with NCI because we'll we'll get on there with some of them. So maybe we'll see you there. Sounds good. All right, Billy. All right. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, that's uh now I want to say this to people looking who are aspiring to be successful as coaches and trainers in the space. Ideally, I think the route should be you train people in person yeah. for a year. You work uh in a big box gym. Why? Because the big box gym is going to provide you with the most leads, pra most opportunities, yes. and practice. Then you go online and work with a place like NCI that teaches you how to build your business. I think that's a, now that's a long approach and some people are like, I just want to get to it. I get that. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, you want to have the best chance, I think in person, big box gym, go NCI as well. And that'll give you the best, uh, the best chance. I think you could do it says. simultaneously. You too. could. Yeah. Um, I've actually given advice to people in his position, like how to build their social media around, uh, you know, like how do you post when you're, when you're, you're starting something or starting a new career like this. And I, you know, let's, you you remember when you first start training, you get one client, yeah. two, two or three, you know, you'll have a handful of clients that you get mm -hmm. that normally the, the gym hands to you to get you started. But what's great is that, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's all new for you, it's new for the client that's training with you. Um, you know, every day there's a teaching moment. Every day there's totally. something that you learn as a coach or that you teach a client. Mm -hmm. And that is what you should use to generate posts and content. Mm -hmm. And so you're not only getting the practice uh, with the hands-on in person, you're also fueling the the content creation for what you should put out online, which then will attract more people that you can help because you're already helping that person in real life. And so it's a, it is a slow process, but I think it's one of the best ways to, to build your business. The online. irony of that, which is funny, is the best coaches out there are always trying to uh, go back and retrace and find those moments that where it had the most impact of like, I learned this very simplistic totally. thing uh, and to be able to pinpoint that uh, is really difficult once you get further in your career. So to start with that in mind, I think is a great yeah, advantage. Yeah, and I, just to hammer this home, if this is what you want to do for a career, it's a very, very rewarding career if you love fitness and health. But if you don't learn how to build a business within the space 
you will fail. I'm just going to tell you that right now. You will, unless you're like hyper talented and gifted, which is super rare, um, you will fail. So you need to place, because trainers do this, they place a lot of focus on learning how to be good trainers. They place very little focus on how to build their business. No, no, no. You got to place a lot of focus on how to build your yeah. business or you will you fail. You got to survive. That's it, 100%. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 